good morning, Peace Church. We do want to welcome you as we gather to worship and celebrate uh, all that God is doing in this time and place. What a beautiful way for us to begin. The church is one foundation for it's all built upon our faith in, in Jesus as we gather together on this day. Uh, we're going to be hearing some empowering messages for you uh, uh, throughout the uh, service today. Uh, we're starting a new way to share scripture readings. Our council members are going to be sharing a scripture with us each week. So you get an opportunity to meet and to know all 12 of our council members over the next several weeks. And we invite you to engage with that process as well. Today, as we gather for worship, we invite you to get your elements ready for communion. We will be celebrating communion throughout the service. Uh, Pastor Winston will be leading us in that a little bit later on. So get those items ready, whatever you have in your home, whether it be bread or cookies or baked goods, whatever it is, uh, 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 grape juice or orange juice, whatever it is. Just make this our, our special way that we connect with one another during communion. So Pastor Whitson, tell us what's going on in the life of our superheroes. Yeah, so superheroes, those of you kids who have been doing our mission boxes with us, the crafts we've been doing, please don't forget to join me today at 1030 this morning for uh, we can over Zoom, we can do those crafts together. Um, also, if you have not already seen Peace Powers episode 5 of our show, it has been released. So you can go and check that out on YouTube, on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and if you'd like to get involved with that as well, you can, if you need to get our e-communications, you can go onto our website and then go under Get Involved and then the Faith Formation Program Plan. And there will be, will be uh, instructions there on how to get our e-communications. I also want to let you know about this um, Thursday, March 11th, is our prayer and meditation group. And so please join us. It's at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday over Zoom. And um, you can also get the link there under also get involved. And then under support groups, you can uh, get that Zoom link. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you for your leadership. We also have a couple of adult groups that continue to meet. We have our men's fellowship group that meets uh, via Zoom on Tuesday mornings at 7. We invite you all to participate and join together with us uh, there. If you'd like that link, please contact the office. We'll make sure that you get connected in a very special way. Also, our women's group meets on Monday evenings at 8 o'clock. The same with that. If you'd like to become involved with that, they're reading a book, but you can still come and participate and get caught up. Please uh, let the office know. They can make sure they get that link. It's also being sent out via our weekly e-ponderings and also on our website. So please uh, check that out. We'd love to have more people involved with that. We have a great group already in both those groups, but we invite you to participate fully with that. We also want to just celebrate all of our prayers as we celebrate what God is doing in this time and place for all the ministries and all their outreach that we continue to provide. Uh, even in the midst of COVID, we, we are still connecting in the community far and wide. For that, I give great thanks for all of you who do your outreach reach and your mission work. We also want to lift up a prayer concern this day. Our own David Marcham's mother passed away uh, in New York, and so we do want to have prayers extended to her uh, family, uh, for David in particular, as he continues uh, journey. He's back with us now, uh, but prayers for David and his family on this journey. We come together knowing that God's grace is with us, so let's celebrate with our opening hymn uh, this day, God of Grace and God of glory.
friends, I do give thanks to stay as we gather God's grace and God's presence that is all around us. During this time that we live in, we need to find the centeredness that we have in our faith, especially with the message that God continues to call us to do and to be in this world. And so I invite you to that moment that we gather together where we explore how Jesus calls us, even in those difficult moments, to share that good news, the powerful news that can transform the world around us. So as we come on this day, I invite you to just pause for a moment wherever you are to take a moment in this time of prayer and let God speak to you and to be with you. God of grace and God of glory, we give you thanks this day for building the strong foundation that we have in our faith, for calling us to reclaim once again that radical good news message that Jesus gave us so long ago. We give thanks, God, for calling us calling us together on this day, whether we're gathered or scattered, whether we are in town or thousands of miles away, wherever we are, we know that we are bound in your grace and bound in your love, and your message of hope binds us together. So God, continue to be with us, continue to form us and shape us and to be with us. And most importantly, God, bind us in your love as we unify our voices in one voice, praying together the prayer which Jesus first taught. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to have an opportunity to celebrate with our council members each week. We're going to be providing our opening scripture for us. And we're kicking off with Lynn Alcock, who is our council president, to share with us Psalm 19. Hi, Peace Church. This is Lynn Alcock. I am a member of the council. And I'm looking forward to when we can worship in person. In the meantime, here's a recorded scripture. Today's reading is Psalm 19. I'll be reading from the message version of the Bible. God's glory is on tour in the skies. God craft on exhibit across the horizon. Madame Day holds classes every morning. Professor Knight lectures each evening. Their words aren't heard. Their voices aren't recorded. But their silence fills the earth. Unspoken truth is spoken everywhere. God makes a huge dome for the sun, a super dome. The morning sun's a new husband leaping from his honeymoon bed. The daybreaking sun, an athlete racing to the tape. That's how God's word vaults across the skies from sunrise to sunset. Melting ice, scorching deserts, warming hearts to faith. The revelation of God is whole and pulls our lives together. The signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. The life maps of God are right showing the way to joy. The directions of God are plain and easy on the eyes. God's reputation is 24 karat gold with a lifetime guarantee. The decisions of God are accurate down to the nth degree. God's word is better than a diamond, better than a diamond set between emeralds. You'll like it better than strawberries in spring, better than red ripe strawberries. There's more. God's word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way or know when we play the fool? Clean the slate, God, so we can start the day fresh. Keep me from stupid sins, from thinking I can take over your work. Then I can start this day sun washed Scrub clean of the grime of sin. These are the words in my mouth. These are what I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar. O oh God, my altar rock. We give thanks for Lynn for sharing those beautiful words with us, calling us back to God's message that can guide us each and every step of the way. It's all based on God's grace and God's love. Let's hear this beautiful arrangement from both Andy and Dylan. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. 
Thus how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and, and grace say amen. We give thanks uh, for both Andy and Dylan. Dylan always finds a way to get these creative pieces together. Um, and I do have to say that Andy is out doing Dylan in his uh, uh, beard growing event. So we give thanks for that as well. We do want to take a moment as we uh, uh, continue in our service to celebrate all that God is doing in this time and place. Uh, Pastor Winston mentioned earlier about the superheroes uh, that are taking place out in our community. And so we want to hear our children's message for today from Pastor Winston. Hey kids, Pastor Winston here. So if we saw the last episode, if you haven't already, check out episode five of Peace Powers. A lot of stuff happened there. And as you can see, we're really coming to find out that Brick Brain and Frozen Fiend are lost. And actually that's gonna be our theme for this month that we're gonna talk about. How do we love when we are lost? a lot of times we feel lost in life or we talk to others who seem to be lost. And so we thought there was a good story that we could talk about that relates to that theme. And it's the story of Jonah and the whale. The story of Jonah goes something like this. We're not going to hear all of the story today, but we'll hear part, a good part of it. A long time ago, God came to a guy named Jonah and told him, Go to the great city of Nineveh, because they're doing bad things there. Warn them. Tell them they must stop behaving so badly. But Jonah didn't want to go. He decided to try to run away from God. So instead of going to Nineveh, he boarded a ship going in the opposite direction, away from Nineveh. After a while at sea, a huge storm came. Everyone on this ship was terrified and was wondering why this storm seemed to come out of nowhere. Well, Jonah started to think that maybe this storm was all his fault because he was running from God. So he told the people on the ship to throw him overboard and the storm would quiet down. The ship crew did just that. And sure enough, the storm went away. 
Now God didn't want Jonah to drown. So God provided a large fish or a whale to come and swallow Jonah up. Jonah lived in the belly of this whale for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to God, telling God how much he loved God. After that, the whale spit Jonah up onto a beach and he walked toward Nineveh. Now, have you ever been asked to do something that you didn't wanna do, kind of like Jonah? Maybe your family members, your mom or dad or grandparents, asked you to do something that you didn't feel like doing. How does it feel when you don't want to do something? How do you feel after you've done it? I remember when I was little, the first time I ever mowed the grass with a lawnmower, I didn't want to do it. I thought it would be too hard. I was all upset. Eventually, I did the job. And I remember afterwards when it was done, I looked at how nice the grass looked. And I was proud that I did it all by myself. Has anything like that ever happened to you? There are many times in life when all of us have to do things we don't like or don't want to do. But oftentimes we make it harder by fighting against those things so much. We might feel better if we don't fight so hard. Remember that by doing hard things, that's often how we grow. And we do hard things because many of them are important. For example, people don't like to clean, but we like to have clean things, clean rooms, clean dishes to eat from, clean clothes. So we have to remind ourselves sometimes why we do difficult things. And remember that yes, there are times when we have to do work, but there are also times that we can play and to try to enjoy all the parts of life as best we can. Now, before we go, don't forget about your crafts this week. You're actually going to make a Jonah and the whale kind of like a toy uh, out of clothespin and some supplies. So take a look there and join us too over Zoom. We can do the crafts together after the service if you want. Well, that's it. And I hope to see you again. Go Peace Powers. Well, thank you, Pastor Winston, for sharing uh, that message with us. As we continue to engage and explore how God is calling us to be united one with another, we know that God's peace is with us each and every day. So let's enter this time of prayer, inviting God to bless us and to hold us and to keep us. There is peace. Let's join together in a moment of prayer. God, we know that there is peace, there is joy, and there is hope. It all comes through you. And for that, we give great thanks as we gather to celebrate all the wonderful mysteries that you provide to us throughout our life's journey. We come and celebrate your presence each and every day and, and know that with it all, your grace comes in powerful and mighty ways. 
You build it all on this wonderful foundation that you call this your church. And through it all, we continue to share the good news of justice and peace throughout the world. Continue, God, to guide us in these difficult, troubling times. Help us to find peace, not only for ourselves, but for the world around us. Call us, O oh God, to be your servants in this time and place. As we gather, we lift up all those, all those in our midst who are, are struggling this day, whether it be from disease or ailment or just life itself, the impact of COVID upon our personal lives and upon our world. We just pray that we be overwhelmed by your grace and your love and restored once again. We give thanks for all the healthcare providers who continue to provide services in so many ways, not only in our healthcare institutions, but, but even uh, in our, uh, our restaurants and in our grocery stores and all those places that we need for essential, the essentials of life. We give thanks for all those on the front lines doing all they can, and for that we give great thanks. We give thanks for those who are working to provide vaccines for, for all people. And for that, we give great thanks as well that one day we will have a, a full complement in place and that all will have that opportunity. We give thanks for the other ways that you touch our lives and you bless us on our journeys. And for that, God, all we can say is thank you. We give thanks this day, O oh God, for all those saints all those saints of the church that work so hard and diligently for justice and peace, and especially this day that we pray for those in our, in our care facilities, those who are feeling so isolated and alone. So this day we pray for Evelyn Stiller and Doris Underdahl, for Joanne Amundsen and Lou Van Gallis, for Audrey Johnson, Ruth Martin, and Russ and Dolores Kelch. We lift up Dean Bauck and Linda Frost, Muriel Holly, Bev Morton, Glenn and Mildred Lilliscove, Marjorie Burrows. And we pray for those who are in their homes yet still feeling somewhat confined. Let them know that our, our love extends to them as well, for Betty Allen and Helen Corfitz, for Sue Dale and Hal Call it, Cal Holly, for Ed Rust and Ed and Mabel Wagner. We just ask you to bless all of our dear friends, all those saints of the church. And we pray for all the rest as well, all who are watching, all those who, who are just finding themselves just needing that spiritual uplift. And God, we just ask you to come and to turn our minds, to turn over our lives so they can once again see you and feel your presence with us. So God, we give thanks. Thanks for your work in this time and place. And know that indeed that you are in the midst of all. We give thanks this day because we know that your peace, your joy, your hope is with us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, my friends, we give thanks this day as we continue to gather and celebrate during this Lenten season, and it is a rather different Lent, is it not? By now, we would have our garden starting to grow. We do have some beautiful plants uh, that Scott has provided for us this morning, but our garden is gone, and it feels a little empty up here and naked. But I know that we are not alone on this Lenten journey. And so I want to read this passage, which is a very familiar passage for many of us as we continue to engage in our journey through Lent. This powerful passage of Jesus cleansing the temple. From chapter 2 of John, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords. He drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? 
And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, I love that passage. We all know that one so well. We hear about that from our childhood days and Sunday school. Throughout our journey of faith, we hear about the story of Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. Now, when I was preparing for this this week, I, I, I was on a couple of Zoom calls with people, and I had a couple of phone calls, and I, and I received that inevitable question that we always receive, especially during Lent, and it goes something like this, Pastor Paul, why was Jesus executed? That's one of those tough questions that we pastors get because, you know, we pastors, we can't say anything in short phrases. We have to embellish to the winds but I tried to give the best answer I could. And while there are many gospel stories about Jesus being on the outs with the religious leadership of his day, this story, this one about turning the tables in the temple is that proverbial straw that broke the camel's back for him. Now Jesus, if you look back over his life, had a, had a rather tumultuous relationship with organized religion. You'll remember how as a young child, Jesus went with his family to Jerusalem for the high holy days. And while there, he he engaged the theologians in, in such hot debate that he forgot to go home, much to the chagrin of Mary and Joseph, his parents. And later as a young man, Jesus preached in his own hometown synagogue in Nazareth. And his radical, revolutionary message was was so upsetting that the people tried to throw him off a cliff, and he managed to escape. And now in the 33rd year of his life, Jesus once again clashes with that religious system. But this time, there was no escape. His angry tirade at the the money lenders and the the sacrifice sellers in the temple courtyard will blunt any remaining goodwill felt toward him. And while his claim that if the temple is destroyed, he will raise it up again in three days may be a reference to his own death and resurrection. In the real time of the moment, it comes across to those who are there that day as nothing less than a threat to destroy the most sacred of their holy places, the temple. The gospel writers tell us that after this outburst, the decision is made, Jesus must be destroyed. Now, if you really want to dig deep into this passage, which I love to do, if you really want to dig down deep inside this passage, it's important to note that Jesus' radical revolutionary ministry of grace was always controversial and yet until now it did not result in capital punishment. So I want you to think about this. When he offered forgiveness to the sinners there were questions about whether he had authority to forgive sins but they didn't kill him for it. When he healed on the Sabbath, there were, there were complaints that he was violating Sabbath laws, but they didn't kill him for that either. When Jesus cast out demons from those troubled souls whose lives were tormented by evil, some whispered that he must be caught up in the darkness of the occult. But they didn't kill him for that either. No, they didn't kill Jesus out in Galilee when he unlawfully ate with tax collectors and sinners. And they didn't kill Jesus in Samaria where he unlawfully conversed with a Samaritan woman. They didn't kill Jesus in in, in Bethany when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And they didn't kill Jesus in Simon's house where the prostitute poured oil over his feet and then tearfully wiped them up with her hair violating the social norms and laws in so many ways. 
So do you see that Jesus was not killed by any of the many very places or settings or situations where he violated all the social and religious conventions? It wasn't until he brought his gospel, the real gospel of love and grace to the church that Jesus was put to death. Now, I love to listen to your stories. I love to hear stories about your faith and how God has come into the midst of it, about how God has touched your lives in redemptive and transformative ways. There are so many of you watching today that I've heard your stories, and and many of you are simply walking miracles. God powerfully and personally intervened in your lives in very direct ways. Things you can't even explain. And you experience this amazing, grace-filled presence of God. And God, God lifted you up. And God carried you out of the wilderness and darkness. And God carried you into the daylight. And that's the moment, God of grace. That's the moment, I believe, when miraculous recoveries begin. And how I love to hear those stories. How I love to to hear talk about the truly miraculous ways that that God has intervened in your lives and how God intervenes in the midst of the church and provides for those others in our community. Like for Channel One and, and Link and Project Legacy and our local Habitat for Humanity and our women's shelter. Ministry after ministry, time after time, stories of transformation taking place from our ministries from these walls. There are so many true life stories of receiving forgiveness, of receiving grace, of being set free from destructive lifestyles, A moments when some supernatural strength was received to face up to an otherwise impossible challenge. When there was no hope, there was God. Of precious times when when Jesus became real, and it seemed like our, our spirits were reborn once again, and God became more than just a word for us. Many of you experience that in times of grief and loss, that darkness of hurt and pain. And God came to you in the midst of darkness. My friends, I invite you to listen to those stories. I want you to take time to listen to each other's stories. Because what wonderful experiences of God's redemptive love are told in this community. We don't have to be together in person to hear those stories. We can share them in so many ways. Real life stories of how our lives have been intruded upon by God's love and God's grace and God's healing. And yet, here we are today. Here we are in today's reading from John that shows us that there is still a deeper level of faith that we have to travel beyond even that. You see, it's one thing to let God into our secular experiences of our own lives and our own needs, but it's quite another to to really let Jesus intrude into the realm of what we hold most sacred. Yes, the people of of Jesus' day, like, like ours, responded with joy when Jesus, with his healing power, steps into the disease, forgives the sins, and casts out demons. But but when Jesus, when Jesus dares to step into our spiritual life, when Jesus dares to step into our church, into our temple, at Jesus' time they killed him. And I wonder what we do when Jesus does the same to us. When Jesus comes and turns our lives upside down, I began to wonder what would really happen if Jesus would show up here at Peace Church. If uh, this coming rally day, which happens to be September 12, when we're all going to be back together again, I wonder what would happen if, if Jesus came back and joined us for our celebration day. 
frankly, I think it'd be a, a fantastic experience. I'd be willing to bet that if that Jesus would start his day going to faith formation, and I don't think he'd go to the adult class. I know he would find his way down to the dwelling, to the middle or, or high school classes, because they have more fun down there. And there I think Jesus would sprawl out on one of those cushy couches. And I could just picture him spread out there, blaring out Billie Eilish and laughing with the teens and talking about things like, like dating and learning how to drive a car and how to live with faith without feeling weird about all of it. And then after that, after spending time with the, the teens, I could, I could picture Jesus coming up to the, the sanctuary on that day and looking all around at all the wonder and the beauty and all the symbols. And I think as, as we came, came together, as Jesus would be sitting there and the opening song would be sung, I think Jesus would be singing, uh, singing at the top of his lungs, causing people to actually look at him strange thinking, so that's how we're supposed to sing those songs. And when we pray for forgiveness, when we pray for forgiveness, I think Jesus would stand up at the end of the prayer and say, you really are forgiven. Now take it and run with it. And Jesus, I'm pretty sure, would go individually to each person, who's sick and suffering and just touched them with some life-giving way to each person who is lonely, and he would befriend them, to each person who is, is weak and strengthen them for the challenges they have to face when they go from this place back to their home. And then after meeting all our deep human needs, I think Jesus would overturn our tables he would go do the, to the things that we hold most sacred in life, our deepest religious values, our most strongly held convictions about God, and Jesus would expose them as being inadequate and perhaps even fraudulent. And like on that day long ago, Jesus would turn our sense of sacred on its holy head. Jesus had overturned all those simple thoughts that we have, uh, the fluffy Jesus that we, we love to know and turn it into a radical message of transformation for the world. And then we, like so many others before us, would probably want to kill him too because he's unsettling our life. He's disturbing our path. He's pulling us back to what we're actually called to do, and we don't like it. And we cry out, how dare you, Jesus, come into my life and disturb my faith? Who do you think you really are? to call us from our comfortable life into a life that promotes peace and justice and love for all the people. After all, it's one thing to receive a miraculous healing in our life, but it's quite another to learn that all your life you've been actually wrong about God and still another to learn that even after you've experienced God's love, you're still wrong about God because we have to get back to the message that Jesus first taught, what our faith is all based on and that's to liberate the oppressed, to feed the hungry, to house those who have no home. And we gotta stop making it about me because it's about God and God's grace, and God's love. Now, Sonia Ho gave us a wonderful story the other day. It's a Linus story. Linus and Lucy are old favorites. It goes like this. Lucy tells Linus that America needs to go back to biblical principles. So Linus asks, so should we feed and shelter the poor? But Lucy answers, no, I'm not paying for a lazy person. So Linus asks, should we visit and comfort prisoners? Well, Lucy responds, no, they don't deserve that. So, should we pay our taxes without complaining, asks Linus. No, that's, that's my money and I want it. Well, then we should show love and mercy freely. And Lucy answers, no. That has to be earned. 
Linus asks, so, so we should avoid violence. Lucy answers, no. We have to take out those bad guys. So Linus then asks, should we be gracious to foreigners? Lucy responds, no, they shouldn't be here. Finally, Linus asks, should we seek to end social injustice throughout the world? And Lucy answers, no, that's not our problem. And somewhat frustrated, Linus finally asks Lucy, then, which biblical principles are you talking about? You see, I'm afraid in our faith we've fallen into a Lucy trap. We found ourselves trying to succumb to the easy way that doesn't talk about the truth of the gospel, about Jesus coming in and overturning our faith and calling us back to the firm foundation, the church's one foundation. You see, I believe that this unredeemed sense of the sacred is what causes us Christians to be the scandalous people that we really are. Bishop Desmond Tutu once said, it was Christians, not pagans, who led the Crusades. It was Christians, not pagans, who were responsible for the Holocaust. It was Christians, not pagans, who lynched people here in the South. It was Christians, not pagans, who burned people at the stake and all in the name of Jesus Christ. End quote. What kind of sacred value causes such demonic behavior? You see, our sense of the sacred, what we hold most deeply believe about God, makes all the difference in how we live our lives. So here comes Jesus. He's charging into the places that we hold most sacred. He challenges our ideals about God. He shows us another way. He introduces us to an experience of the sacred that is far different than the one that we built our lives on, the far different than what we've learned in Sunday school, even what we've heard in so many sermons and for so many years. Jesus shows up. And he shows us a God like we've never seen before. And he calls us once again back to the foundation of God's love, radical love for all people. In this setting of the temple in Jerusalem where sacrifices are required to obtain forgiveness, we learned previously from the prophet Isaiah that God does not desire us to offer sacrifices to him, but rather to offer mercy to others. Hosea 6.6 says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, says the Lord. What an amazing claim. All our lives, all my life, we've been told that God requires a payback for sin. That's why the animals are being sold in the temple after all. That's why the money is being exchanged to provide an opportunity to pay back God for the sins But here comes Jesus. He says, no more of this. And he turns the tables over. And in that moment, God shows us that God does not want payback. God only wants mercy and justice and grace. God wants to give mercy to you and freely forgive you. And God wants you to give mercy to others with no cost, just grace. And that's really the role. That's really the role of the church in society today. We're not here to judge people. We're not here to point out what's wrong. We are not here in this world to be an isolated island of righteousness and goodness. We are not here to complain about the inability of humankind to live up to the standards of God that we want to impose and to warn them that payback time is coming. Oh, no. We are here to dispense God's mercy. We are here to dispense God's love and grace and experience that grace in amazing ways. So I believe, I believe that the the role of the church is to open up our arms to all people 
Our job is to live and to share God's radical good news for all the people in word and in deed, that God is merciful, that God is gracious and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and God wants to lift up the oppressed. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In the Gospel of Mark's version of this story, He lifts up that the temple should be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And so one of my deepest hopes for this church, our church, Peace Church, our temple, that we will be increasingly become a house of prayer and a blessing for the nations, a study of mercy and grace within which people of faith convinced of God's love for everyone We'll exhaust ourselves advocating for the well-being of the other. How different the world would be if the voice of the Christian church, how different it would be if the voice of peace church spoke not in a language of judgment and condemnation, but in the language and the prayer of love, seeking good for others. And not just for some, but for all. Oh, Jesus is turning tables on those of us who believe. Yes, even us. Yes, even me. For faith is deeper than just receiving God's grace. Faith requires us to let Jesus step into the most sacred places of our hearts and teach us to believe in God all over again in new and powerful ways. So I pray, I pray that we let Jesus come and visit our church, that we engage in the truth of the stories, and when we do, to let Jesus actually turn over the tables that hold us back. The other day, Claire came running back to my office, out of breath and very upset. She exclaimed, Paul, you, don't, well, you won't believe this, but, but, but Jesus is here. I just saw him pull into the parking lot, and now he's coming to the door. What are we going to do? Without even looking up at my computer, I said, look busy. And that's the point. And that's the great idea. Go into the world this week and let Jesus turn over some tables in your lives and other people's lives. Begin engaging the gospel like it was meant to be. Get busy praying. Get busy dispensing mercy and showing grace, advocating for others, and building bridges between people, all the people. And in our day, something miraculously wonderful has happened That's when we really become God's temple. My prayer is that we become a merciful, merciful, grace-filled house of prayer for all the people, and not just in these walls. It's what we do when we step out from this place, what we do from our homes, what we do in our work and, and, and places that we engage with people. And I pray that you have experienced the amazing grace of God like you've never experienced before. Because when you let God take a table and turn it over and shine a new light on your world, amazing things are going to happen. And I'm so thankful, thankful for that. So people of peace, let's get busy. Let's be open to what God has in store for us next. Amen. My friends, we come to this time to celebrate how God calls us to gather around table wherever we are scattered or gathered. We come to God's table on this day. Pastor Wentz is going to lead us in this service. We just invite you to experience the table of grace that is before us. Thank you. Yes, as, um, as Paul mentioned, just grab any elements that you can around you so you can participate with us at this table, the table that Jesus called all of us to, the vulnerable, the hungry, it doesn't matter. You're invited to God's table. And a long time ago, he gathered with his friends and he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. 
And after he gave thanks, he likewise took the cup and he poured it, giving thanks and saying, This is my blood, blood of the new covenant. God calls us through the bread to participate in the body of Christ. And God calls us through the wine, blood, to participate in the new life that Christ gives us. Amen. We come to the table of grace to experience God's love. It's not just for her, us here in this time and place or in your homes, but it's for the whole world. So as we prepare to go for this place, in a moment we're going to hear this beautiful hymn called, O God of Earth and Altar. I really want you to pay attention to the third verse that will be sung, where these words will be sung. Awaken us to action and forge us into one, defying sect and faction. O God, your will be done. Listen up. Oppressive systems snare us. Our apathies increase. Great God in mercy, spare us for justice and peace. That is our call. To live God's goodness, to learn that new message once again, to be empowered to go to this world and share the good news like never before because God is calling us, each and every one of us, so my friends, go in peace this day and share the good news, that radical good news. Friends, God calls us to go from this place to share the good news of justice and peace for all the world. So as we prepare to leave this time of worship, remember who God has called us to be. Because this is our church. We, we make, make it, it what it is. Others will feel welcomed. If, if I am welcoming. It will do a great work. If, if I am my work. It will make generous gifts of any causes. If, if I am a generous, generous giver of my time, time talents, talents, and, and treasures. treasures. It will be a sanctuary for social justice and for peace. 
if I advocate for marginalized communities and practice peace in every setting of my life. It will be a church that embraces all, that builds community and transforms lives. If I, who make it what it is, practice these things. Therefore, with the grace of God, the grace of God, we shall be a safe and inclusive church living that beautiful, radical message of love. And, and I, I shall dedicate, dedicate myself to being all the things I want my church to be. Amen. My friends, go in peace.